How did art change in the 19th century? During the 19th century, the world experienced massive social upheavals due to the Industrial Revolution. The German philosophers Friedrich Engels, 1821895, and Karl Marx, 1818 to 1883, authors of the Communist Manifesto. 1848 believed that the working class, the proletariat, would soon revolt against the bourgeois. Marx in particular was interested in the artist as a member of the proletariat, whose work art was consumed and exploited by the upper classes. Because of the new availability of manufactured goods, Handmade items and traditional crafts took on new value. Other important thinkers also affected 19th century perceptions of art. Such as Sigmund Freud, 1856-1923, an Austrian neurologist who is credited with founding psychoanalysis. Which inspired many artists and writers. The 19th century also saw the rise of the newspaper, and along with it, the rise in the importance of the art critic, whose voice became ever more important in judging and valuing art. Unlike in previous centuries, museums and galleries became important public and business institutions. A change from the previous system of royal or church patronage that characterized art production during the Renaissance. Towards the middle of the 19th century, Romanticism faded and realism became more popular in European art. By the end of the century, the public was shocked by Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, which evolved from realism and, in some cases, a new interest in psychology. How did art change in the 19th century? During the 19th century, the world experienced massive social upheavals due to the Industrial Revolution. The German philosophers Friedrich Engels, 1821895, and Karl Marx, 1818-1883, authors of the Communist Manifesto. 1848, believed that the working class, the proletariat, would soon revolt against the bourgeois. Marx in particular was interested in the artist as a member of the proletariat, whose work art was consumed and exploited by the upper classes. Because of the new availability of manufactured goods, handmade items and traditional crafts took on new value. Other important thinkers also affected 19th century perceptions of art. Such as Sigmund Freud, 1856-1923, an Austrian neurologist who is credited with founding psychoanalysis. Which inspired many artists and writers. The 19th century also saw the rise of the newspaper, and along with it, the rise in the importance of the art critic, whose voice became ever more important in judging and valuing art. Unlike in previous centuries, museums and galleries became important public and business institutions. A change from the previous system of royal or 
church patronage that characterized art production during the Renaissance. Towards the middle of the 19th century. Romanticism faded and realism became more popular in European art. By the end of the century, the public was shocked by Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, which evolved from realism and, in some cases, a new interest in psychology. What is the Gleaners? The Gleaners, 1857, is a painting by Jean-Francois Millet, 1814-1875. A member of the Barbizon School, which depicts French laborers on a monumental scale and exemplifies the transition between Romanticism and Realism. The Gleaners is a large oil painting with soft diffused brush strokes and a sense of nostalgia for the countryside during the time of the Industrial Revolution. The term gleaner refers to rural people who gathered any produce discarded by the farm workers. After the harvest extremely physically demanding work that usually resulted in very little of value. The faces of the peasant women are obscured, rendering the peasants as symbols rather than individuals. The painting elicits sympathy for the rural poor through the soft light and the monumentality of the figures. It also juxtaposes the poor with the wealthy as more prosperous farm workers. With expensive equipment can be seen efficiently harvesting in the background. After seeing the work, some critics believed Millet harbored sympathies for the recent revolutions of 1848. Eliciting controversy despite Millet's denials. What is the Gleaners? The Gleaners, 1857, is a painting by Jean-Francois Millet, 1814-1875. A member of the Barbizon School, which depicts French laborers on a monumental scale and exemplifies the transition between Romanticism and Realism. The Gleaners is a large oil painting with soft Diffused brush strokes and a sense of nostalgia for the countryside during the time of the Industrial Revolution. The term gleaner refers to rural people who gathered any produce discarded by the farm workers. After the harvest extremely physically demanding work that usually resulted in very little of value. The faces of the peasant women are obscured rendering the peasants as symbols rather than individuals. The painting elicits sympathy for the rural poor through the soft light and the monumentality of the figures. It also juxtaposes the poor with the wealthy as more prosperous farm workers. With expensive equipment can be seen efficiently harvesting in the background. After seeing the work, some critics believed Millet harbored sympathies for the recent revolutions of 1848. Eliciting controversy despite Millet's denials. Who was Gustave Courbet?
unlike Millet, Gustav Courbet, 1819-1877, was open about being inspired by the 1848 revolutions in France. He was known for his socially radical beliefs and his loyalty to his hometown of Ornans. Near the border with Switzerland. He believed that artists could only authentically represent their own experiences and rejected traditional academic views on painting. He disliked history painting and believed that art could not be taught. His painting, The Stone Breakers, 1849, predates Millet's depiction of rural poverty and similarly shows two laborers breaking large stones along the side of a road back breaking work. There are certain romantic elements to the painting, such as the sense of nostalgia for the simplicity of rural life. And like the gleaners, the faces of the workers are hidden. Some critics considered this painting a satire that juxtaposes demanding. Physical labor with the mechanical processes of the Industrial Revolution. The canvas is quite large for such a subject at nearly 9 feet long and 5 feet high. Even bigger was Courbet's A Burial at Ornans, 1849. Which depicted a countryside funeral and is over 21 feet long. It was heavily criticized for depicting something as mundane as a poor man's funeral on such a large scale, but that was exactly Courbet's point. The monumentality of the image brings dignity to the ordinary working class and to the rural countryside. Who was Gustav Courbet? Unlike Millet, Gustav Courbet, 1819-1877, was open about being inspired by the 1848 revolutions in France. He was known for his socially radical beliefs and his loyalty to his hometown of Ornans near the border with Switzerland. He believed that artists could only authentically represent their own experiences and rejected traditional academic views on painting. He disliked history painting and believed that art could not be taught. His painting, The Stone Breakers, 1849, predates Millet's depiction of rural poverty and similarly shows two laborers breaking large stones along the side of a road back breaking work. There are certain romantic elements to the painting, such as the sense of nostalgia for the simplicity of rural life. And like the gleaners, the faces of the workers are hidden. Some critics considered this painting a satire that juxtaposes demanding physical labor with the mechanical processes of the Industrial Revolution. The canvas is quite large for such a subject at nearly 9 feet long and 5 feet high. Even bigger was Courbet's A Burial at Ornans, 1849 which depicted a countryside funeral and is over 21 feet long. It was heavily criticized for depicting something as mundane as a poor man's funeral on such a large scale, but that was exactly Courbet's point. The monumentality of the image brings dignity to the ordinary working class and to the rural countryside.
Why was Honor Domie arrested? Honor Domie, 1808-1879, was a painter and famous lithographer whose cartoons were regular features in Parisian newspapers. His realist works tended to focus on the plight of the urban poor and frequently criticized the French government, including Louis Philippe, which got him into trouble. His 1831 lithograph, Gargantua, published in the comic journal La Caricature, depicted the king as Gargantua, a grotesque character from the books of French Renaissance writer Rabelais. The king is large and bloated, with thin legs and a pointed head. He sits, enthroned, while poverty-stricken French subjects carry heavy loads of offerings in baskets up a ramp, directly to the king's open mouth. Aristocratic scavengers huddle underneath the ramp, hoping to catch any dropping coins. While in the far right corner, a poor, malnourished woman attempts to feed her baby. Such a negative depiction of the king resulted in a fine of 500 francs and a six-month jail term. For Domier on the charge of inciting contempt for the government and personally insulting the king. This punishment did not stop the artist as in a later lithograph, called Freedom of the Press. 1834, Domie aggressively criticized government censorship. The work of Honor Domie demonstrates the role of art as social commentary as well as the power of both image and text. Why was Honor Domie arrested? Honor Domier, 1808-1879, was a painter and famous lithographer whose cartoons were regular features in Parisian newspapers. His realist works tended to focus on the plight of the urban poor and frequently criticized the French government, including Louis Philippe, which got him into trouble. His 1831 lithograph, Gargantua, published in the comic journal La Caricature, depicted the king as Gargantua, a grotesque character from the books of French Renaissance writer Rabelais. The king is large and bloated, with thin legs and a pointed head. He sits, enthroned while poverty-stricken French subjects carry heavy loads of offerings in baskets up a ramp, directly to the king's open mouth. Aristocratic scavengers huddle underneath the ramp, hoping to catch any dropping coins. While in the far right corner, a poor, malnourished woman attempts to feed her baby. Such a negative depiction of the king resulted in a fine of 500 francs and a six-month jail term. For Domier on the charge of inciting contempt for the government and personally insulting the king. This punishment did not stop the artist as in a later lithograph, called Freedom of the Press. 1834 Domie aggressively criticized government censorship. The work of Honor Domie demonstrates the role of art as social commentary as well as the power of both image and text. What was the Russian realist movement?
as in France, 19th century Russian artists were increasingly critical of the traditional approach to art promoted by the Academy of Arts. In a powerful show of protest, a large group of students, 13 in total, withdrew from the Academy and formed a group later known as the Pervizniki, or the Wanderers. The Wanderers preferred art that was socially aware and promoted the values of the Russian working class and peasantry. Common themes in Russian realist art were peasant scenes, landscapes, and images of the Russian clergy. The group took their art on the road and traveled to towns and cities that would not normally attend the salons and galleries of St. Petersburg, creating uniquely accessible art. Artist members of the Wanderers included Ilyuropin, 1844-1930, Vasily Perov. 1834-1882, Nikolai G. E., 1831-1894, and Ivan Kramskoy, 1837-1887, among others. What was the Russian realist movement? As in France, 19th century Russian artists were increasingly critical of the traditional approach to art promoted by the Academy of Arts. In a powerful show of protest, a large group of students, 13 in total, withdrew from the Academy and formed a group later known as the Pervizniki, or the Wanderers. The Wanderers preferred art that was socially aware and promoted the values of the Russian working class and peasantry. Common themes in Russian realist art were peasant scenes, landscapes, and images of the Russian clergy. The group took their art on the road and traveled to towns and cities that would not normally attend the salons and galleries of St. Petersburg, creating uniquely accessible art. Artist members of the Wanderers included Ilyuropin, 1844-1930, Vasily Perov, 1834-1882, Nikolai G. E., 1831-1894, and Ivan Kramskoy, 1837-1887, among others. Who were the pre ray flights? Also known as the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, this group, lead by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Started out in 1848 as a secret society of students at the Royal Academy School in England who rejected the perceived materialism of the Victorian period as well as the teachings of the Academy. The Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, which also included William Holman Hunt and John Everett Millay, found the work of the 19th century academy to be artificial and decadent and instead preferred the simplicity and apparent sincerity of renaissance masters such as Fra Angelico and Jan van Eyck. The Pre-Raphaelites also valued the moralistic themes of these artists and favored religious themes. Significant Pre-Raphaelite paintings include Hunt's The Awakening Conscience. 1853 to 1854, Millet Christ in the Carpenter Shop, Christ in the House of His Parents. 
1849-1850, and Rossetti's The Girlhood of Mary Virgin, 1849. The Pre-Raphaelites were greatly supported by the English art critic, John Ruskin. Were sometimes characterized as romantic, and went on to influence the 174 aesthetic movement, the Symbolists, and Art Nouveau. Who were the pre ray flights? Also known as the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, this group, led by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, started out in 1848 as a secret society of students at the Royal Academy School in England who rejected the perceived materialism of the Victorian period as well as the teachings of the Academy. The Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, which also included William Holman Hunt and John Everett Millay. Found the work of the 19th century academy to be artificial and decadent. And instead preferred the simplicity and apparent sincerity of Renaissance masters such as Fra Angelico and Jan van Eyck. The Pre-Raphaelites also valued the moralistic themes of these artists and favored religious themes. Significant pre-Raphaelite paintings include Hunt's The Awakening Conscience, 1853-1854, Millet Christ in the Carpenter's Shop, Christ in the House of His Parents, 1849-1850, and Rossetti's The Girlhood of Mary Virgin, 1849. The Pre-Raphaelites were greatly supported by the English art critic, John Ruskin. Were sometimes characterized as romantic, and went on to influence the 174 aesthetic movement, the Symbolists, and Art Nouveau. What is the Gross Clinic? The Gross Clinic is an 1875 realist painting by the American painter, Thomas Aikens, and depicts Dr. Samuel David Gross performing leg surgery in front of medical students. The choice of subject matter was shocking to the traditional art critics and the painting was rejected by the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition in 1876. The painting is notable for its use of chiaroscuro. A sharp contrast of dark and light that is reminiscent of Baroque painting. Powerful beams of light highlight both Dr. Gross's forehead and bloody, scalpel-wielding hand, emphasizing his intelligence and dexterity. The patient's leg has been cut open, revealing the muscle underneath the skin. Causing the patient's mother, also among the audience, to recoil and hide her face. The Gross Clinic highlights Aikens's dedication to realism and is an important example of 19th century American painting. What is the Gross Clinic? The Gross Clinic is an 1875 realist painting by the American painter, Thomas Aikens, and depicts Dr. Samuel David Gross performing leg surgery in front of medical students. The choice of subject matter was shocking to the traditional art critics and the painting was 
rejected by the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition in 1876. The painting is notable for its use of chiaroscuro. A sharp contrast of dark and light that is reminiscent of Baroque painting. Powerful beams of light highlight both Dr. Gross's forehead and bloody, scalpel-wielding hand, emphasizing his intelligence and dexterity. The patient's leg has been cut open, revealing the muscle underneath the skin. Causing the patient's mother, also among the audience, to recoil and hide her face. The Gross Clinic highlights Aikens's dedication to realism and is an important example of 19th century American painting. Who was Winslow Homer? Winslow Homer, 1836-1910, was an American painter who worked as a magazine illustrator and war correspondent during the Civil War. He is known for his depictions of leisure activities and outdoor scenes. And like Thomas Eakins was a proponent of realism. Though his work is characterized by its nostalgia for the simplicity of the pre-industrial era. His painting, Snap the Whip, 1872, monumentalizes a traditional children's game and includes a depiction of a one-room schoolhouse and boys dressed in simple, country clothes with no shoes on. The scene is in stark contrast to the pain of the Civil War and the changes brought on during its aftermath and during the Industrial Revolution. Who was Winslow Homer? Winslow Homer, 1836-1910, was an American painter who worked as a magazine illustrator and war correspondent during the Civil War. He is known for his depictions of leisure activities and outdoor scenes. And like Thomas Eakins was a proponent of realism. Though his work is characterized by its nostalgia for the simplicity of the pre-industrial era. His painting, Snap the Whip, 1872, monumentalizes a traditional children's game and includes a depiction of a one-room schoolhouse and boys dressed in simple, country clothes with no shoes on. The scene is in stark contrast to the pain of the Civil War and the changes brought on during its aftermath and during the Industrial Revolution. Who was Henry Osawa Tanner? Henry Osawa Tanner, 1859-1937, was the first internationally renowned African-American artist and was the most successful African-American artist of the 19th century. He studied under Thomas Aikens at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art and later moved to Paris, where he spent the majority of his career. Tanner is often considered a realist painter. For example, while the Annunciation, 1898, 
is a common biblical subject. Tanner includes realistic details he drew from his travels in the Middle East, such as clothing styles and interior. Decoration that visually grounds the Virgin Mary's divine encounter with the angel Gabriel. Tanner's most famous painting, The Banjo Lesson, 1893, is a quiet depiction of an elderly black man teaching a young boy to play the banjo. The painting emphasized the dignity of the scene during a time when Similar scenes would have been rendered as comical or stereotypical. Like the paintings of French realists such as Millet and Courbet. Tanner's work exhibits social awareness and a sense of monumentality. Tanner's later work was predominantly religious. As the artist preferred to paint biblical subjects that reflected the struggles of 19th century African Americans. Who was Henry Osawa Tanner? Henry Osawa Tanner. 1859-1937, was the first internationally renowned African-American artist and was the most successful African-American artist of the 19th century. He studied under Thomas Aikens at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art and later moved to Paris, where he spent the majority of his career. Tanner is often considered a realist painter. For example, while the Annunciation, 1898, is a common biblical subject. Tanner includes realistic details he drew from his travels in the Middle East, such as clothing styles and interior. Decoration that visually grounds the Virgin Mary's divine encounter with the angel Gabriel. Tanner's most famous painting, The Banjo Lesson, 1893, is a quiet depiction of an elderly black man teaching a young boy to play the banjo. The painting emphasized the dignity of the scene during a time when similar scenes would have been rendered as comical or stereotypical. Like the paintings of French realists such as Millet and Courbet. Tanner's work exhibits social awareness and a sense of monumentality. Tanner's later work was predominantly religious. As the artist preferred to paint biblical subjects that reflected the struggles of 19th century African Americans. Who was Manet? Edgeward Manet, 1832 to 1883, is considered by many to be the first modern painter. He not only bridged the gap between realism and impressionism, but his work foreshadows early 20th century painting styles and approaches. He was highly knowledgeable about art history, and fiercely rebellious. Preferring art he deemed sincere, rather than perfect. Along with thousands of paintings by other premier artists of his day. Manet's work was rejected by the Salon, the official art exhibition of the Palace of Fine Arts. But, Manet had the opportunity to shock critics and viewers at a specially organized Salon de Refuses. Or, Salon of the Rejected, with his painting L.E. Dejeuner sur El Herb. 
the luncheon on the grass, 1863, and again in 1865 with another masterpiece, Olympia. Though Manet's work drew inspiration from the great masters, he focused on scenes of modern life. Including café and leisure scenes around Paris, war paintings and lithographs inspired by contemporary literature. His work is among the most critically acclaimed and valuable in all of art history. However, Manet never achieved this kind of universal recognition during his lifetime. Now, he is considered one of the founding fathers of modern art. Who was Manet? Edouard Manet, 1832-1883, is considered by many to be the first modern painter. He not only bridged the gap between realism and impressionism, but his work foreshadows early 20th century painting styles and approaches. He was highly knowledgeable about art history, and fiercely rebellious. Preferring art he deemed sincere, rather than perfect. Along with thousands of paintings by other premier artists of his day. Manet's work was rejected by the Salon, the official art exhibition of the Palace of Fine Arts. But, Manet had the opportunity to shock critics and viewers at a specially organized Salon de Refuses or, Salon of the Rejected, with his painting Le Déjeuner sur El Herb. The Luncheon on the Grass, 1863, and again in 1865 with another masterpiece, Olympia. Though Manet's work drew inspiration from the great masters, he focused on scenes of modern life including café and leisure scenes around Paris, war paintings and lithographs inspired by contemporary literature. His work is among the most critically acclaimed and valuable in all of art history. However, Manet never achieved this kind of universal recognition during his lifetime. Now, he is considered one of the founding fathers of modern art. What was so shocking about Manet's paintings? Manet's Le Déjeuner sur El Herbe, The Luncheon on the Grass. 1863, was couched in art historical tradition, and draws clear connections to a 16th century painting. From the Venetian Renaissance called the Pastoral Concert, which also depicts a small gathering of minstrels and partially nude women relaxing in a country setting. The nudity alone was not enough to shock 19th century viewers, but it was apparently the contrast between the well dressed men and the complete nudity of the central female figure who stares confidently out form the picture plane, that pushed it over the top. She, and a semi-naked bather in the background, were interpreted as prostitutes. Le Déjeuner sur El Herb was not a neoclassical work, nor a modest depiction of female beauty as was common from the Renaissance but a bold portrayal of contemporary figures engaging in what was perceived of as immoral behavior. Manet's equally shocking Olympia, 1863, also drew on Renaissance predecessors. 
specifically Titian's Venus of Urbino, but instead of a demure reclining nude. Manet presented a boldly staring woman who confronts the viewer with her nudity. While in Titian's painting, a small dog, a symbol of loyalty, is curled asleep at the foot of the bed. Manet's painting includes a black cat with yellow eyes and an arched back. Though both of these paintings were shocking to the public, they were hailed by some. Including Emile Zola, as masterpieces for their ability to communicate truth through realism. And for confronting traditional approaches to painting. What was so shocking about Manet's paintings? Manet's L.E. Déjeuner sur l'herbe, The Luncheon on the Grass. 1863, was couched in art historical tradition, and draws clear connections to a 16th century painting. From the Venetian Renaissance called the Pastoral Concert. Which also depicts a small gathering of minstrels and partially nude women relaxing in a country setting. The nudity alone was not enough to shock 19th century viewers. But it was apparently the contrast between the well dressed men and the complete nudity of the central female figure. Who stares confidently out from the picture plane, that pushed it over the top. She, and a semi naked bather in the background, were interpreted as prostitutes. L.E. Dejeuner sur Elherb was not a neoclassical work, nor a modest depiction of female beauty as was common from the Renaissance but a bold portrayal of contemporary figures engaging in what was perceived of as immoral behavior. Manet's equally shocking Olympia, 1863, also drew on Renaissance predecessors. Specifically Titian's Venus of Urbino, but instead of a demure reclining nude. Manet presented a boldly staring woman who confronts the viewer with her nudity. While in Titian's painting, a small dog, a symbol of loyalty, is curled asleep at the foot of the bed. Manet's painting includes a black cat with yellow eyes and an arched back. Though both of these paintings were shocking to the public, they were hailed by some including Emile Zola, as masterpieces for their ability to communicate truth through realism. And for confronting traditional approaches to painting. Why did Louis XIV build the Palace of Versailles? From 1638 to 1715, King Louis XIV the Sun King reigned over France with absolute power. During his rule, France was the most powerful country in Europe. In the 1660s, Louis XIV made a radical decision to renovate Louis XIII's country hunting lodge and transform it into France's new royal palace, Versailles. This change meant that the aristocrats, diplomats, and all servants would leave the Louvre in Paris and move to the relatively isolated country location. Architects Louis L. Eva and Charles L. E. Brun oversaw the redesign of Versailles and the finished building was a massive, nearly city-sized structure with enough space for over 20,000 people. 
including 14,000 servants. The scale was unprecedented. The Palace of Versailles is an enormous, formidable structure with a severe, classical exterior, manicured gardens, and opulent interiors. Besides any political motivations Louis XIV may have had for relocating the palace. Versailles also served to glorify this powerful king. As the Sun King, Louis XIV emphasized his divine right to rule and his unquestionable power. The king's bedroom was at the center of the palace. He performed elaborate morning and evening rituals that represented the rising and the setting of the sun. The Great Hall of Mirrors, also in the center of the palace, is 240 feet long with 47 foot high ceilings. The hall gets its name from the hundreds of mirrors and glass panels that inundate the room with sunlight. The vaulted ceiling in the Hall of Mirrors, inspired by Karachi's work at the Farnese Palace. Were painted by Charles L. E. Brunn and feature images of classical gods and the military successes of the king. The gardens surrounding the palace were designed by Louis L. Eva and André L. E. Notre. The gardens are made up of pools, monumental sculpture, and thoughtfully planned paths. The formal gardens at Versailles are carefully manicured. Further emphasizing the wealth and power of the king. What is St. Peter's Square? St. Peter's Square is far from rectangular. From an aerial perspective it actually looks like a keyhole, an oval next to a trapezoid. The space serves as a grand entrance to St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican. The heart of the Catholic Church. It is defined by a quadruple road colonnade that extends from the basilica's facade and then wraps around an ovoid piazza. Framing a central obelisk brought from Egypt by Roman Emperor Caligula. The shape of the colonnade has been described as a mother's arms that reach out from the church to embrace the worshippers who gather there. Gian Lorenzo Bernini's design for St. Peter's Square. Known in Italian as Piazza San Pietro, is probably his best known architectural project. It was an incredible challenge to design a space that could contain the crowds that come to the Vatican to hear the Pope. And to unify a space that contains styles from so many different periods of history. Bernini's design included hundreds of columns and pillars, along with hundreds of statues of saints. Like the Church of I. L. Gesù, Bernini's Piazza San Pietro incorporates many different architectural elements. And yet it maintains a grand and harmonious feel. Why was Honor Domier arrested? Honor Domier, 1808-1879, was a painter and famous lithographer whose cartoons were regular features in Parisian newspapers. His realist works tended to focus on the plight of the urban poor and frequently criticized the French government, including Louis Philippe, which got him into trouble. His 1831 lithograph, Gargantua, published in the comic journal La Caricature, 
depicted the king as Gargantua, a grotesque character from the books of French Renaissance writer Rabelais. The king is large and bloated, with thin legs and a pointed head. He sits, enthroned, while poverty-stricken French subjects carry heavy loads of offerings in baskets up a ramp, directly to the king's open mouth. Aristocratic scavengers huddle underneath the ramp, hoping to catch any dropping coins. While in the far right corner, a poor, malnourished woman attempts to feed her baby. Such a negative depiction of the king resulted in a fine of 500 francs and a six-month jail term. For Domier on the charge of inciting contempt for the government and personally insulting the king. This punishment did not stop the artist as in a later lithograph, called Freedom of the Press. 1834, Domier aggressively criticized government censorship. The work of Honor Domier demonstrates the role of art as social commentary as well as the power of both image and text. What was so shocking about Manet's paintings? Manet's L.E. Déjeuner sur El Herbe, The Luncheon on the Grass 1863, was couched in art historical tradition, and draws clear connections to a 16th century painting. From the Venetian Renaissance called the Pastoral Concert. Which also depicts a small gathering of minstrels and partially nude women relaxing in a country setting. The nudity alone was not enough to shock 19th century viewers but it was apparently the contrast between the well-dressed men and the complete nudity of the central female figure, who stares confidently out from the picture plane, that pushed it over the top. She, and a semi-naked bather in the background, were interpreted as prostitutes. L.E. Dejeuner sur Elherb was not a neoclassical work nor a modest depiction of female beauty as was common from the Renaissance. But a bold portrayal of contemporary figures engaging in what was perceived of as immoral behavior. Manet's equally shocking Olympia, 1863, also drew on Renaissance predecessors. Specifically Titian's Venus of Urbino, but instead of a demure reclining nude. Manet presented a boldly staring woman who confronts the viewer with her nudity. While in Titian's painting, a small dog, a symbol of loyalty, is curled asleep at the foot of the bed. Manet's painting includes a black cat with yellow eyes and an arched back. Though both of these paintings were shocking to the public, they were hailed by some. Including Emile Zola, as masterpieces for their ability to communicate truth through realism. And for confronting traditional approaches to painting. What are some significant examples of 18th century neoclassical architecture? Chiswick House designed and built between 1724 and 1729 by Robert Boyle. The third Earl of Burlington in West London, England. Greatly inspired by the architect Palladio and his Villa Rotunda. 
Chiswick House features an octagonal dome and a large but simple portico with an empty pediment. The overall style is restrained, flat, and symmetrical. Pulteney Bridge designed by celebrated Scottish architect, Robert Adam, 1728-1792. Who also designed great buildings such as the Edinburgh City Chambers and Gulzine Castle in Ayrshire, Scotland. The unique, Palladian style Pulteney Bridge. Completed in 1773, crosses the River Avon in Bath, England, and is lined with shops. Theatre de Elodian, originally called the Theatre Francais. This austere neoclassical building was designed by Marie-Joseph Payer between 1767 to 1770. Almost completely void of decoration. The portico features columns of the simplest Tuscan order and has no pediment. The building emphasizes its horizontality and geometric symmetry. Monticello designed by Virginia Statements and author of the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson, as his private residence in Charlottesville between 1769 and 1782. With later redesigns between 1796 and 1908, Jefferson was interested in developing a uniquely American style of Architecture that would promote patriotism and help to form the new country's national identity. How did art change in the 19th century? During the 19th century, the world experienced massive social upheavals due to the Industrial Revolution. The German philosophers Friedrich Engels, 1821 and Karl Marx, 1818-1883, authors of the Communist Manifesto. 1848 believed that the working class, the proletariat, would soon revolt against the bourgeois. Marx in particular was interested in the artist as a member of the proletariat, whose work art was consumed and exploited by the upper classes. Because of the new availability of manufactured goods, Handmade items and traditional crafts took on new value. Other important thinkers also affected 19th century perceptions of art. Such as Sigmund Freud, 1856-1923, an Austrian neurologist who is credited with founding psychoanalysis. Which inspired many artists and writers. The 19th century also saw the rise of the newspaper, and along with it, the rise in the importance of the art critic, whose voice became ever more important in judging and valuing art. Unlike in previous centuries, museums and galleries became important public and business institutions. A change from the previous system of royal or Church patronage that characterized art production during the Renaissance. Towards the middle of the 19th century. Romanticism faded and realism became more popular in European art. By the end of the century, the public was shocked by Impressionism and Post-Impressionism. Which evolved from realism and, in some cases, a new interest in psychology.
who was Francisco Goya. Francisco Goya y Luciens, 1746-1828, was a Spanish Romantic painter who lived to see Napoleon. Bonaparte absorbed Spain into his empire, a violent massacre of the people by the new government. The restoration of the Spanish monarchy, and the reinstitution of the Spanish Inquisition. Goya who at one time was the court painter for Spanish King Charles IV, and painted a perhaps too realistic, arguably unflattering portrait of the royal family in 1800, was inspired by the Enlightenment ideas of the French Revolution and deeply disappointed by the failure of those ideas to instill fundamental change in Spain. Charles IV cracked down hard on social change, even banning the entry of books into the country. Goya series of 80 etchings, Los Caprichos, The Caprices, completed between 1796 and 1798. Respond to what Goya perceived of as the folly of the Spanish people at the time. The sleep of reason produces monsters, an aquatint etching from the series. Depicts reason personified as a slouched, sleeping figure. While reason is preoccupied by slumber, ominous creatures emerge from the darkness. Including owls, bats, and a cat with wide, glowing eyes. Goya's work suggests the genius of Velázquez, the satire of Hogarth, and the refinement of Reynolds. While illustrating a highly individual and complex imagination steeped in Spanish mysticism and superstition. Other important paintings by Goya include 3rd of May, 1808, 1814-1815, which commemorates the massacre of Spanish prisoners by the French. Dark paintings such as Saturn devouring one of his children, 1820-1823, and many portraits. What is Romanticism? Romanticism was an intellectual, cultural, and artistic movement that went against the rationalism of the Enlightenment and instead emphasized emotion and subjectivity. Romanticism developed in the mid-18th century and remained popular until well into the mid-19th century. It coincided with neoclassicism, and some neoclassical art is even considered romantic. Because of its frequent idealism and nostalgia for the past. During the Romantic period, there was a new interest in medieval literature, art, and architecture. Inspiring Gothic revival, which was particularly popular in British domestic architecture. Romanticism transcends the visual arts and includes music and literature as well. Both Beethoven and Chopin are considered part of the Romantic movement. As are Victor Hugo, William Wordsworth, Herman Melville, and Edgar Allan Poe. Romantic painters include Thomas Gainsborough, William Blake, Francisco Goya. Theodore Gericault, Eugene Delacroix, Jean Auguste Dominique Angra, John Constable, Joseph Mallard William Turner, and the artists of the Hudson River School, among others.
Who was William Blake? William Blake, 1757 to 1824, was a deeply religious English printmaker, painter, and poet who disliked the formal training of the Royal Academy and spent his career working on highly imaginative projects, including a series of prophetic books modeled after the Bible, which he wrote and illuminated. Blake did not believe in drawing from life, and naturalism was not his goal. He drew on his imagination for visual cues and his works are complex, thematic, and often influenced by the style of medieval manuscripts. He created his own mythology that included characters such as Urizen, a name derived from the phrase, your reason, who embodies rationality. In one of his most enduring images, The Ancient of Days, 1794, which is also often called God creating the universe, Blake blends the styles of Michelangelo with medieval iconography to depict the bearded figure of Urizen reaching down from the clouds his open hand extending into the form of a compass that glows with yellow light from heaven. While Michelangelo's images of God are graceful and all-powerful, Blake conceived of Urizen as a complex negative force, and his The Ancient of Days is bathed in deep red and dark tones. William Blake's art was not particularly well received during his lifetime but garnered much critical attention about a century after his death. He is no considered one of the most important English artists in history a significant romantic artist who felt dissatisfied with the promises of the Enlightenment and the values of neoclassicism. Who was Caravaggio? Michelangelo Marisi, 1571-1610, better known as Caravaggio, was a complicated artist. He never had a workshop or any apprentices, and seemed more comfortable in the dark alleys of Rome than in the grand churches and palaces of his high-status patrons. Prone to violence, Caravaggio frequently ran into trouble with the law. In 1606, he killed a man in a street fight, prompting the Pope to issue a warrant for his death. He was, however, one of the greatest naturalist painters in history and his powerfully realistic paintings promoted Christian themes of redemption and salvation. Caravaggio was also a skilled still-life painter. One of his most notable still-lives is Basket of Fruit, 1597. Against a yellow background, a wicker basket filled with aging fruits and leaves sits on a window ledge. The purple grapes are starting to turn a moldy gray color. Green leaves are wilting, some are covered in brown spots. A red and yellow apple is browning around two apparent worm holes. The former sheen and health of this fruit is apparent, but only a slight tinge of life remains. The basket of fruit is so close to the picture plane that it is almost confrontational. Forcing the viewer to notice the passing of time. The painting has been interpreted as symbolic of the fleetingness of youth and beauty.
What is Jasperware? Developed by the English potter Josiah Wedgwood, Jasperware is a type of porcelain best known for its popular white on blue. Unglazed finish, though various other colors were also used, and neoclassical design. Wedgwood hired sculptor John Flaxman to recreate highly popular molded relief images. That closely mimicked ancient Greek vase designs, which had been recently discovered. Jasperware was effectively marketed and manufactured on a large scale. Making Wedgwood's neoclassical designs available to a wider public than decorative objects made before the Industrial Revolution. Jasperware, and Wedgwood pottery as a whole, remain very popular to this day. What is the sublime? During the 18th century, philosophers established three different categories of aesthetics. The beautiful, the picturesque, and the sublime. In 1763, Immanuel Kant, philosopher of the German Enlightenment wrote observations on the feeling of the beautiful and sublime, and in this treatise, he described beauty as relating to formal harmony. While the sublime related to intangible awe and a feeling of being overwhelmed. Edward Burke explained the concept of the sublime in the philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful, 1957, when he wrote. Whatever is fitted in any sort to excite the ideas of pain, and danger, that is to say. Whatever is in any sort terrible, is the source of the sublime, as quoted in Pierce 93. An interest in the grandeur and vastness of the aesthetic experience, the concept of the sublime mirrored. The values and interests of the romantic movement emphasizing emotion, mystery, and the imagination. What is picturesque? Though the literal meaning of picturesque is like a picture. The term refers to the aesthetically pleasing qualities of a painting that come from texture. Lighting, composition, and engaging formal irregularities. During the 18th century, British painters found the 17th century landscapes of artists such as Nicholas Poussa and Jacob Van Ruisdael to exemplify the picturesque due to their subtlety and mystery. So inspired, British architects even designed gardens after landscape paintings. And during the 19th century, Britain saw a surge in domestic tourism to such picturesque locations as the Lake District and the Scottish Highlands which were made popular by romantic poets such as William Wordsworth and Sir Walter Scott. What was the Gothic Revival? Also known as the Neo-Gothic Movement, the Gothic Revival was an 18th hand. 19th century architectural movement characterized by the revival of medieval style. 
and coincided with the increased popularity of medieval literature and poetry. A good example of Gothic Revival architecture is Strawberry Hill. The private home of Horace Walpole, 1717-1797, in Twickenham, England. Walpole's home design included round turrets topped with crenellated battlements. Tooth-like notches used for defense in medieval buildings. And pointed arch tracery windows similar to those found in French Gothic cathedrals. Another example of Gothic Revival architecture is the Palace of Westminster in London. Which was rebuilt after a fire in 1834. Gothic Revival architecture was a popular style. For universities both in Europe and the United States, including the University of Glasgow. The University of Chicago, and the City College of New York, among many others. What was the Russian realist movement? As in France, 19th century Russian artists were increasingly critical of the traditional approach to art promoted by the Academy of Arts. In a powerful show of protest, a large group of students, 13 in total, withdrew from the Academy and formed a group later known as the Pertvizniki, or the Wanderers. The Wanderers preferred art that was socially aware and promoted the values of the Russian working class and peasantry. Common themes in Russian realist art were peasant scenes, landscapes, and images of the Russian clergy. The group took their art on the road and traveled to towns and cities that would not normally attend the salons and galleries of St. Petersburg creating uniquely accessible art. Artist members of the Wanderers included Ilya Rapin, 1844-1930, Vasily Perov, 1834-1882, Nikolai Ge, 1831-1894, and Ivan Kramskoy, 1837-1887, among others. How are the landscapes of Constable and Turner different? John Constable, 1776-1837, and Joseph Mallard William Turner, 1776-1851, were both successful British landscape painters and yet their styles and approaches to nature were almost completely opposite. After spending some time training at the Royal Academy School in London, but disliking academic convention, Constable dedicated himself to studying nature and searching for truth in his home village of East Holt, in the Suffolk countryside. In an attempt to garner respect for landscape painting, Constable's canvases were very large. His painting, The Haywain, Landscape, Noon, 1821, is over six feet long, for example. His paintings are clear, detailed, and infused with emotion which is expressed in heavy clouds, reflective ponds, and glistening foliage. Usually calm and pristine. Constable's landscapes offer a subjective image of the manicured English countryside. 
by comparison, Turner's landscapes are a whirlwind of drama and dissolved images. And present nature as an overwhelming power capable of consuming man and his impermanent structures. Turner is known for his enormous oil paintings, as well as innovations in watercolor. Particularly the borderline abstraction of his sweeping brush strokes. Turner's paintings were shocking at the time. His 1842 painting Snowstorm, Steamer Off a Harbor's Mouth, for example, depicts a ferocious ocean storm within with the actual steamer is barely visible. And it is nearly impossible to differentiate between the swirl of dark clouds and the thrusts of the thrashing waves. Unlike Constable's careful, controlled nature, Turner's is a monster. What is Baroque Classicism? Baroque Classicism is a specific style of Baroque art that draws heavily on classical influences and is characterized by refined idealism, realism, and an interest in antiquity. The dramatic use of chiaroscuro is not quite as evident in Baroque Classicism. It was most popular in France, and preferred by the painters such as Nicolas Poussat. Claude Lorraine, Charles L. E. Brun, and the architect Louis L. E. Vaux. Some art historians consider the Italian Annabelle Caracci, whose work greatly influenced Poussat, a classicist as well. Who was Gustave Courbet? Unlike Millet, Gustave Courbet, 1819-1877, was open about being inspired by the 1848 revolutions in France. He was known for his socially radical beliefs and his loyalty to his hometown of Ornans. Near the border with Switzerland. He believed that artists could only authentically represent their own experiences and rejected traditional academic views on painting. He disliked history painting and believed that art could not be taught. His painting, The Stone Breakers, 1849, predates Millet's depiction of rural poverty. And similarly shows two laborers breaking large stones along the side of a road back breaking work. There are certain romantic elements to the painting, such as the sense of nostalgia for the simplicity of rural life. And like the gleaners, the faces of the workers are hidden. Some critics considered this painting a satire that juxtaposes demanding physical labor with the mechanical processes of the Industrial Revolution. The canvas is quite large for such a subject at nearly 9 feet long and 5 feet high. Even bigger was Courbet's A Burial at Ornans, 1849, which depicted a countryside funeral and is over 21 feet long. It was heavily criticized for depicting something as mundane as a poor. Man's funeral on such a large scale, but that was exactly Courbet's point. The monumentality of the image brings dignity to the ordinary working class and to the rural countryside.
Who was Jacques Louis David? Jacques Louis David, 1748 to 1825, was arguably the most important French painter working in the neoclassical style. Whose art first exemplified the values of the French Revolution? And then the imperial style of Emperor Napoleon. In his history paintings, such as The Oath of the Horatii, 1784, David depicted patriotic Roman scenes, which emphasized themes of sacrifice and heroism, and captured the spirit of the revolution. His 1793 painting, The Death of Marat, which was commissioned during the bloody reign of terror, commemorates the bloody death of Jean-Pierre Marat, a Jacobin journalist and politician murdered while in the bathtub by a woman aligned with the Girondins, an opposing political faction. Marat was known to have a debilitating skin disease, and often worked while soaking in the bathtub. The painting idealizes Marat, whose body slumps over the edge of the tub, which is presented in a minimalist fashion against a simple bathroom. Quite unlike Marat's real bathroom, which was rather more opulent. In his left hand, Marat still holds a handwritten note, while in his right hand, a quill. Nearby is the bloody knife that the assassin, Charlotte Corday had used to stab him through the chest. David belonged to the same political party as Marat, and this painting clearly serves as political propaganda. Once the revolution was over, David's political fortunes rose and fell. He served a short time in prison, and then as the president. But, he eventually aligned himself with a new power, Napoleon Bonaparte, who ruled over France from 1804 to 1815, and became an important patron for David. <laughs>